everyone's really keen to uh, to get started with uh, with the Nalisha and the and the time we have with her today. Mm -hmm. so I once again um, extend the warmest of welcomes to everyone this morning for from the Northwest uh, Learning Collaborative and um, wanted just to run through a, a little bit about uh, the event today but let me start perhaps with um, an introduction from myself and um, for, for those many of you who haven't perhaps met me before I, I'm Leslie Massey uh, I, I'm the Chief Executive of Aqua uh, one of the partners in, um, in this collaborative endeavour um, who support these collaborative master classes. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about the six partners within the Northwest Collaborative who are working with you today. Um, as I say, I um, come from an organisation called Aqua, but I'm also delighted to work alongside um, the innovation agency Northwest Coast. Uh, we have Northwest Employers. Uh, Northwest ADAS and also Mersey Internal Audit and last but by no means least the Northwest Leadership Academy um, and uh, we all come together to um, support and provide the sort of learning opportunities uh, and masterclasses such as these uh, for you our, our members uh, uh, along the year and um, we've got to um, uh, give you an opportunity to see what we've got coming up today. I think Effie, you might well have a slide that uh, shares today's, oh, that's jolly small. Um, however, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can see that we, we are going to do uh, an overview of the workshop in a moment, and that'll be an opportunity before that for me to introduce Nalisha this morning, tell you a little bit about our guest today. We've got some practice sessions, which uh, we'll be running through with Nalisha's guidance and indeed some breakout sessions which gives you an opportunity to work with smaller groups of people in conversation. You can see they're dotted through the agenda um, and we'll then come to, to come back together again at the end uh, with a summing up but with a view that we'll be closed by 12.15 uh, and um, what I would say is that this is really not a lot of time for what is a fantastic amount of content. And I know Nalisha will be keen to point out this is something that's going to whet the appetite, but also couldn't possibly give you the level of detail that I suspect uh, you're going to want. It's going to leave you hungry for more. Um, so we'll talk, talk a little bit about how you can reconnect with Nalisha at the end of today should you want to pursue um, a more in-depth uh, review of, of this sort of work. We would really invite folks to Twitter. Uh, if you're tweeters, um, you can see that there's a, a hashtag Collaborative Northwest uh, for you to be able to share your comments about today and let everybody know what, what you're hearing and what you're learning. Uh, we're recording the session today, so we will give it um, out to colleagues who've not been able to join and indeed for you who may well want to listen again uh, in your own time. Um, we're not going to be breaking off formally for tea and coffee uh, because obviously, you know, we really want to keep the pace going. But, you know, if you want to take a comfort break, by all means, just uh, shut your camera off and um, take five minutes out and then rush back to be with us again. But, but please do that uh, as, as you feel you, you need to. But without uh, further ado, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, Nalisha Wickramasinghe. This today is joining us for the second time. I think some of you on the call were uh, able to be with us on uh, the November event, which was extremely well evaluated. And we did record that session. So again, if you want to go back and, and, and listen to that, um, you absolutely uh, can. Um, but this, this uh, whole topic and as a collaborative, we felt it was important to in, invite Nalisha back as we focus on this theme of well-being um, for this, but also for the next two masterclasses, which you're going to be hearing a bit more about later on today. But we have two more masterclasses on the 5th and then again on the 26th of March. 
Uh, and as I say, we will, we will give you some more information about that later. But this emphasis and this focus on well-being um, is so important, is it not? Uh, not? Never so more than at this point when we're in the midst of this dreadful pandemic. Uh, and when paying attention to ourselves and the critical importance of the quality of the relationships that we have, we've been starved, haven't we, of so many of those interactions um, and, and, and it's been incredibly difficult. Uh, but I think this, this particular topic of conscious leadership and strengthening collaborative relationships uh, is exactly the sort of conversation we should be having. So let me tell you a little bit about Nalisha. Well, frankly, when I, when I looked at this lady's CV, um, I, I was really quite uh, taken aback because how does somebody juggle and have such an exciting CV and manage to fit all these things in. Um, Nalisha's a psychologist, she's an author, she's an educator, uh, she's an international leadership and organisational change consultant. Wow, not, not many of us can say that. Um, she's worked in the field um, for, of, of human development for, for 30 years. This is a lady who knows what she's talking about and comes with uh, quite an extensive uh, range of experiences. She also works as a private therapist, um, as well as with large corporates, teaching and consulting on healthy growth. Um, in addition to her role at the SAVE Business School, she's also a founding director and lead practitioner in the dialogue space. And I, I suspect Alicia might tell us a little bit more about the dialogue space, but this is a place that um, helps develop um, in, for individuals, families and organisations. Uh, her professional practice combines brain science and developmental psychologist to develop, psychology, sorry, to develop personal and relational resilience and collaboration in increasingly volatile times, and we're certainly in those, are we not? Her work is particularly appropriate uh, for these current days, and that's why I suspect Nalisha's in uh, high demand when it comes to talking about her work. And actually, excitingly, uh, Nalisha's got uh, a new book, um, which I, again, I, I hope she'll tell us a little bit about. And today's session um, is, a, is a little bit of a taster of that new book, uh, Beyond Threat. Um, and um, it will, uh, and also, also a book being with others. Now, I suspect, Nalisha, I might have got that the wrong way round. So please correct me. The new book is Being With Others, is it not? That was such Please. a lovely introduction. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so, yeah, so in this session, there, there is a lot to cover and let, let's see what we can achieve together. But what I'm hoping to explore is how we become more conscious of the choices and decisions and actions that we take in our lives and how conscious intentional behavior can support our relationships both at home and at work. So we're going to be working with the ideas that hopefully you've had a chance to just have a little look at in the pre-session articles, but don't worry if you haven't. Before we begin, though, I, I also want to acknowledge the particular challenges that, you're, uh, that you in the public sector are, are continuing to deal with and the impact this might be having on your physical and mental health. So we know that when we're experiencing constant threat, our bodies and our brains are becoming flooded with potent cocktails of cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline, which on the plus side, of course, motivate us to respond to urgency and danger. But because our threat response is intended to be effective in short term crises, when it's constantly active, we're going to be suffering some of the effects of chronic stress. And one of those effects is our ability and willingness to learn and collaborate with others. So in these times that we're in, I'm going to encourage you to cultivate a compassionate response to the feeling states that you're experiencing. And also to keep reminding yourself, if you can, that emotions pass if we allow them to. So in the first session that I ran for the collaborative, uh, which some of you may have attended, we practice using our breath to develop a mindful and soothing response to regulate threat. 
And actually, if, if that's all we can do right now, that's enough. Even though um, some of these ideas and its learning application might feel a bit compromised for you right now, I do hope that you can get something out of these. And at some point, perhaps when things calm down a bit, you can bring these concepts and practices um, to, to your teams and organizations. So don't worry if right now it feels like I've got too much to do, I can't do this stuff. It will come, is, is the message. So I've been researching and writing a lot about the threat response over many, many years um, and its impact in our lives and, and how we might regulate it. And in doing so, cultivate these safe brain states I talk about. However, it has become increasingly clear to me that many, many people find it incredibly difficult to regulate threat. It's one thing to say, you know, use your breath, take time out, do, do those things. But in the clients that I see, people struggle. So in my more recent research and the motivation for writing that second book was because I, I want to understand a bit more about why that is so. Why is it so hard to get out of our threat-based habits and loops? And my conclusion really is, maybe obvious, but I want to say it anyway, is that hu being human is not and never will be easy. There are experiences within and around us that trigger and sustain our threat response and cause us suffering and pain. And so much so that in my work, I've referred to them as curses. And I hone in on five in particular, which if we don't learn how to deal with, will and cause us real problems in our life. So let's be clear that curses in the sense that I refer to them are those experiences we have that keep triggering and sustaining the activity of our threat brain. So let's have a look at um, these five curses very quickly. So the first one is the curse of consciousness. Let me say a little bit about that. Whilst being able to think about ourselves as having a past and a present and a future is a significant evolutionary advantage, thinking can also cause us many difficulties. So consciousness causes us problems because it gives us too many things to think about. And if we pay attention to the quality of many of our thoughts, we often notice how riddled they are with worries and judgments and criticisms or anticipations and remembered fears and so on. So as conscious creatures, we're also aware of our mortality, the fact that we will die. And this fact alone for many of us can create a permanent, if unconscious, sense of unease or anxiety in us. And I just wanted to refer back always to this uh, great biologist, Robert Sapolsky, who reminds us that zebras, for example, don't get ulcers or become neurotic because when the threat of being chased and eaten by predators passes, they're able to resume peaceful grazing. They don't have complex consciousness, so their threat brain switches off appropriately. We conscious creatures, humans, however, are able to create and recreate danger in our minds. We can ruminate on all the what ifs and if onlys. And in doing that, we're prolonging our anxiety and fear. And so consciousness through our cognitive uh, and imaginative faculties can make us ill. The second curse that I write about is the curse of memory. We have a memory which remembers and research tells us over and over again that negative memories are more easily surfaced than positive ones. For example, we're far more likely to remember and recount the one thing that went wrong for us in our day rather than the five things that went right. And that's because we've evolved to detect and prioritize problems and threats first, what we call survival information. So memory becomes a curse when we allow its problem-focused tendency to interfere with present experience. Um, a common example might be the instant dislike we take to a person because, and only because, they bear some resemblance to someone we disliked in the past. 
And most of us possess a huge array of prejudices, opinions and biases that are rooted in and fertilized by ancient memories. So becoming conscious of our memories is one of the first steps in being able to integrate and manage them and how we learn to see uh, new information in our present moment. The other three curses arise from uh, the influence that our families and our culture have on our developing character. And I really can only touch on this huge subject here, but in essence, what we are told and learn we should be by culture, which is handed down through our parents and our early schooling, can seriously interfere with, the way, with who we are. So all of us have yearnings and propensities and potential that can be thwarted or misshapen by the demands and dictates of others. So culture, for example, it instructs us on how to be a man or a woman, our gender, and what to value or not value in life. And these cultural messages, which vary across cultures, inform the way that our parents and later our teachers author our lives. So we become cursed by our character, our own character, when we absorb and are controlled by other people's versions of what we must be. And actually most of us are, because initially these versions do enable us to learn about and to survive the environment in which we were born. However, maturity and wisdom, conscious leadership, involves discovering what else exists within and around us beyond what we are told. So this curse of character makes itself known to us as we go about our lives. It, it appears in the mistakes and problem patterns that mess us up and our relationships up. And this happens because we're not recognizing the conflict between who we are, who we essentially are and what we've told to be, told we should be. And what happens is we then become torn or fragmented. And these inner conflicts that we experience trigger our threat brain. So when we start to gain awareness of who we are, as opposed to who we've been told to be, we can start to diminish those three curses. And we become what I write about or call a creating self instead of a constructed self. So look, consciousness, memory, our character and the dictates of family and culture and, and, and so on are all shared human experiences. And unless we deal with them, they become shared human curses. And what breaks these curses is the growth of yeah. consciousness. Yeah. Um. Enabling us, so the, the growth of consciousness enables us to become more um compassionate and aware of the truth of our lives, not as we are told it is, but as it is. Unfortunately, though, and this is um, where we kind of start to move into some of the challenges and difficulties we have, most of us um, do not choose to or have the opportunities to become conscious because it takes time, learning opportunities, effort, and often it's really painful and difficult. So instead what we do is we manage these curses using an array of psychological defenses, which is the next slide, and I call them spells. Um, and these create the illusion that we're coping and that we're not in threat and that everything is as it should be. And as you can see from the slide that these defenses include things like denial, which is convincing ourselves that there's no problem, or projection, which is getting rid of aspects of ourselves by placing them in another person or situation. So a classic example would be a person who never gets angry, but sees anger in everyone else around them. And intellectualization, which is happening more and more in a culture dominated by um, rationalist ideals. So intellectualization is finding a rational answer to everything even when some of our experiences require a very different approach and level of understanding. So you might want to look at those and think, yeah, I probably do a few of those. We all do. 
Um, so perception practices, uh, in a nutshell, are intended to redirect the flow of our attention from defending, from using psychological defences, to perceiving, to developing deeper understanding. And they cultivate a quality of attention that supports deeper understanding. And what, the way they do this is that they engage the intuitive right hemisphere of our brain, which I'm going to come back to later, and support the growth of consciousness by opening up the way that we attend to our world. And in doing so, helping us to become much more receptive to the meaning and message of our experiences. So what these practices are doing is that they're offering an alternative to those defences um, and giving us uh, so the common strategies of denial, repression and avoidance. And they're also giving us an alternative to the quick fixes and simplistic solutions that many of us resort to when we're feeling conflicted or stressed or uncertain. So what I'd like to do now um, is engage in the first practice. The way this session is flowing is we'll take each of those practices, noting, receiving, inquiring and imagining, uh, and we'll have a little go with them. But as we said earlier, this is really a taster session. Um, and if you're interested, uh, please research it more and, and contact me if you if you feel you'd like to. OK, so the first practice, which is to notice what is happening inside us and if necessary, as we're noticing, to soothe threat emotions, which can be felt as tension or tightness or tingling and so on. And in doing this, we're bringing ourselves back to our centre, which is a calmer and more relaxed state from which we can then begin to engage in practice too. So um, I think most of you do have your... Um, videos off and I encourage you to have them off for these exercises because I think it just creates a little bit more privacy uh, for, for what we're going to do. All I'm going to do is talk you through a really short noticing exercise and I'm sure some of you have already come across these and, and have had various successes in using them. Uh, so if you have that's fine, here's an opportunity for practice and if you haven't, well let's begin. So um, the practice is intended to draw your attention inward and allow you to begin to start acknowledging and connecting with your emotions and your feelings. And we remember perhaps from session one, for those of you who came, that all behaviour, the end behaviour, starts in the body. And when we begin to learn how to accurately name our emotions, the feelings and thought process and eventual behaviours which follow are much more likely to be effective and satisfying for us. So with your videos off, um, the first thing we do is find a good posture in our chairs. Now, many of us are probably leaning back in the chair. What I recommend is you, you shuffle forward a little bit so your back is not um, leant against the, 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 the chair back. And you're thinking about giving yourself a body to ch a chance to do this exercise. So you want to think about spinal alignment. And you can do this actually by tucking your chin in and you'll notice as you do so that your spine from like being there aligns and you might want to feel that. You might want to relax your shoulders by just rolling them, just finding yourself in a more relaxed and comfortable uh, position. And then what I'd like you to do, if you can, is, is if you're comfortable to, is to close your eyes so that that inward motion is uh, supported without external stimulation. So as in all perception practices, we start by connecting with our breath. Um, we're not meditating here. We're just connecting with that amazing faculty within us that keeps us alive and does a quiet job for us every second of the day. But closing your eyes, just take a minute to notice your breathing and its rhythm and its depth. And don't try to change anything, just, just notice what's happening for you. And 
you might feel it's quite shallow or irregular. It's okay, just notice. You might notice your thoughts want to wander off to what you need to do today and just bring them back to the rhythm of your breathing. And if you can, if you're a mouth breather, for the reasons I gave in session one, see if you can close your mouth for this exercise. It's a short exercise and breathe in and out through your nose. And now what we're going to do is turn our attention inward into our bodies. And just trying to notice the sensations that you might be feeling in your muscles, your stomach or your heartbeat. You might be noticing the temperature of your skin. You might be feeling your nerve endings. They might be tingly or numb. And again, just resisting the urge to judge or analyze or change anything. Just be with your body for a moment. Appreciating the work that it does for you all through the day. Now what I'm gonna ask you to do is take a few deeper breaths through your nose. And as you deep, take a deep breath in, you notice how the oxygen, oxygen draws energy into the body. So you might find yourself almost sitting up as you draw energy into your body. And it's on the exhale that the body starts to relax, not on the inhale. So your breath comes in, it draws precious energy in. And as you slowly exhale, you have a sense hopefully of relaxing a little bit more deeply softening your shoulders and so on. And now bring your attention into your stomach area, which is often where we first feel emotion. And if that stomach, if your stomach is tense or tight, see if you can just let it soften, perhaps by directing your breath towards the tension and letting it go in the exhale. Breathing into the stomach, and letting it go in your exhale. Do that for a couple of moments. Don't be afraid to take in deep breaths and slow it down on the exhale. Now draw your attention to your hands and your arms. You might want to stretch out your fingers again using your breath take out any tension or tightness in the exhale. And then noticing your neck and your throat. The neck is often where we hold in tension and a tightening in the throat, which affects your breathing. Let them be soft. Roll around your shoulders if that feels good. Again, relaxing with the breath. Maybe softening your jaw by moving it around gently and helping your face and facial muscles also become slack and soft. And breathing, don't forget to breathe. Relax your shoulders if they're tensing and don't worry if your mind strays, that's perfectly normal. Just bring it back as you can to your breathing. And then finally, just allow your attention once more to travel through and across your whole body, maybe starting from the head down to the face, each time trying to soften and relax. And maybe taking one more deep breath. <clears throat> And when you're ready, return to the room. If you want, you can turn your cameras off, uh, sorry, on, or just keep them off and keep that sense of privacy and quietness for yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, what I'd just like to do is just take a pause for a second um, and just allow or invite people to just type into the chat where and how that exercise, very short two minute exercise, three minute exercise has left you feeling. If you just go ahead and type one, one or two words, um, it's useful for me to just connect with you. And Sam, yes, thank you, Lisa, centered. And it's nice for everyone else to just see how colleagues are interacting with these exercises. Lovely, great, good. Hopefully we're getting ourselves into a place where we can move into some of the more tricky practices. Great. Okay, that's lovely. And, and keep adding to that. Sleepy is good too. So look, if we're disconnected from your from our bodies and the emotions that pr they produce in us in response to experience, we are far more likely to get in a muddle further up the stream um, into feelings, thoughts and behaviours. When we do start to notice what we are, what's going on inside us, we will start hopefully from a place of calm, which is what people are typing into the chat. But as we go deeper, which is where I want to take you in this session, we might start to notice things that make us feel anxious. And we might decide, yes, anyone can join, that's fine. Um, Keely. Um, but when we start to go deeper into our bodies, we might start to notice things that are less than relaxed. Um, and, and, and make us feel anxious. And this is why I want to now move on to practice two. So practice two, which we, we didn't cover in session one. So session one focused a lot more on soothing threat. But practice two is where I notice so many of my clients fall out of the learning because what they discover isn't... Uh, acceptable or, or, or um, palatable to them. They don't, they don't really want to face into too deeply some of the pain and struggle that they have. So receptivity to experience starts when we start to learn and accept that real experience is not only that which is happening in the external world, but what is happening in here in our internal world is also very real. So our day and our night dreams and all that we imagine, for example, significantly influence the way we feel and think and behave in the world because these inner experiences, just like external experiences, trigger emotions in us, those neurological happenings. So, for example, we all know what it's like to wake up from a dream, which we might not remember in all its detail but whose mood or affect remains with us all day. So even though we may not understand the strange sensations and images and symbols of this inner world, in practice too, what we're doing is committing to both acknowledging them and allowing the possibility that they have meaning and message. And cynicism and scoffing and over intellectualizing and hiding and denying feelings and thoughts that don't feel right are all signs that we might be closing down our experience. And one of the most active inner characters who helps us close down our experience is our inner critic. And we touched on that in session one. So our inner critic is acting as a censor whose control, it, you know, it has kind of good intent because it's trying to protect us from some of this more painful, difficult stuff. But it's controlling and dictating to us what we should and shouldn't do or be. And many people are failing to access and benefit from deeper knowing because of this critic. And in creative process, the inner critic is a total blocker. And this critic seems to appear to us when we least want or need it to. It kind of bullies us when we're stressed or it reprimands us when we make a mistake. However, 
there are many ways in which we can soften this inner critic. And I'm going to summarize a little, a, a few of those in a moment. But again, I want us to try a basic exercise called the self-compassion break. And again, some of you may have heard of this. Um, these are introductory exercises which can take us further and deeper should we choose. But what the self-compassion break is doing is it's interrupting the potentially toxic loop of feelings and thoughts that this critic triggers in us. And it encourages us, as in practice too, to stay open and receptive to whatever is arising in us. And we can do this practice now, although I would say that it's a practice that works better in the moment um, of you experiencing stress or anxiety or pain. Um, which you may be experiencing now, so, so that's good, we can try it, but it may also be, as I'm going to talk you through, I'm going to ask you to bring up a memory of a recent experience um, of difficulty. So once again, <clears throat> let's close our eyes and find our posture, and with practice this becomes really second nature, and you'll really miss it when you don't do it in your day. At the moment it might be a bit more of a beginner's practice. So let's close the eyes because this is an inward practice again. And with all perception practices, as I just said a moment ago, take a moment to connect with your breath, which becomes your anchor and your focus when you find yourself getting distracted or overwhelmed. And in any moment when you're not feeling great, you can return to the rhythm of your breath for comfort. Okay, so just connect with your breath. All right, self-compassion break, which as I said, you would normally do in the moment of feeling bad. But let's think of a time recently when you have felt stressed or fearful or angry with yourself. Try and bring that moment of suffering or pain fully into your mind. When you're remembering where you were, who was there, how it felt like, what thoughts you had, just try and really conjure that memory into mind's eye and get back into that moment. And that might mean you re-experience some of those difficult emotions now, which is okay. And don't, don't worry if you can't find a moment, just just flow with the exercise, but if you can, bring it to mind. And what we're doing here is we're acknowledging and making contact with experience as they arise in your body and mind. We're not trying to deny them. Now, as they're coming up, say to yourself something like, this is a moment of suffering. Or, yeah, this is stressful. Or, wow, this hurts. And in doing this, you're being with rather than denying your memories or your current experience. Just acknowledging them with a simple phrase. This is stressful. This hurts. Once you've acknowledged and allowed that experience to be, you remind yourself that suffering is a part of life. And you're saying something like, I'm not alone in this. We all struggle in life. And this is how it feels when a person struggles. And actually what works really well is you can place a hand on your heart um, or wherever it feels soothing. Some people like to stroke their, their arm or, or, or hold their face. And you're feeling the warmth and the gentle touch of your hand reassuring yourself in these moments of struggle. And that may seem strange at first, but it really works, particularly in the moment of pain. And now say to yourself, May I be kind to myself in this moment. May I give myself what I need. 
May I be forgiving and kind in this moment. And this is a mantra, a self-compassion mantra, that you can repeat gently and over again to block the voice of the inner critic that might want to come in now. This hurts, I am not alone, and may I give myself what I need. Just try those words to yourself as you imagine and recreate the difficult experience that you've had recently. It's stressful. I'm not alone. This is how it feels when we struggle. And may I be forgiving and kind in this moment. And you might notice that other voices coming in trying to stop you doing this. That is the practice. Just trust in that process and say gently to yourself words that work for you. And remember to breathe and soften. And if some of you feel tearful or there's grief emerging, allow that to be. And again, end the practice by making, taking a few deeper breaths through the nose if possible. And when you're ready, just come back to the group. And again, if you feel like it, just type um, your thoughts into, into, the, uh, into the chat. I mean, this is a quiet, reflective session. You, have, you will have a chance to talk to each other in a moment. And as I said before, that exercise tends to work a lot better when you're actually in the midst of having an inner critic attack or a stress attack. And it's just a reminder that we all struggle, common humanity, um, as, as self-compassion talks about. And that in those moments, the last thing you need is your inner critic gnawing away at you. You need a kinder, your self-compassionate voice uh, taking over. Yeah. Yeah, physical pain will come. Yeah, and, and for those of you who do have a strong inner critic, and many, many do, this this is a practice and with repetition it will bring benefit it won't probably work straight off in one go yeah the tactile the stroking and the holding of the wrist are all very important um feel drained yeah well you know sharon when we open ourselves to what's actually going on in our bodies uh, countless times that is what people say to me they're exhausted and it's often you know when we go on holidays um, and many people get ill on holiday because they're suddenly going from toxic drive into uh, supposed rest and the immune system then is releasing all sorts of things that will make you ill yeah Don't be afraid, people, to allow memory to come back. See, memory, as I said, becomes a curse when we try and put a lid on it all the time. It doesn't go away. It just leaks out and bursts out in other, in other ways. Yeah. Okay. Just keep breathing in and out through your nose and we're going to move into practice three, which is inquiry. So 
when we are centered, practice one, and when we are able to be receptive to our experience, we can then start to inquire into the meaning of our experience to gain deeper understanding. And often we don't do this. We leap from the emotion to an action, often a distractive action, without much in between. And this reactive or mindless behavior is really ineffective unless it's an urgent reaction to a life-threatening situation. Although actually recent research is suggesting that even in these life-threatening circumstances, I don't know if there are paramedics here or people who work in, in that field, that pausing just for a moment before leaping into action is beneficial. And in that pause, we try and find our center. We try and stay open to what's happening. And we ask ourselves, what's going on here? What's the purpose and meaning of this experience? And when we become practiced at this, this process occurs really quickly. It's not a navel gazing type uh, you know, activity. It becomes second nature. We notice, we soothe, we receive, we inquire. Um, and you can ask yourselves how much of that goes on in your life right now. So if we're moving into practice three, many of you are working in an environment right now, which is hugely solution focused, and this is understandable. Yeah, I would say it's not impossible to bring perception practices into your work when it's stressful and pressurized. And we could even argue uh, that that's when it's most needed. So a team, for example, who are meeting to plan and decide what to do next could benefit from a 10 minute pause where they check in with their feelings. They engage in a two minute centering practice. You give them a moment just to clarify their thoughts and perhaps maybe surface a question or two or, or ponder meaning before turning to decision and solutions. However, as we move into practice three, I want to say that powerful questions can be quite difficult to find. And we can see on the powerful questions slide, um, characteristics of a powerful question, they're quite tough to find a powerful question. And so what I'd like you to do in the breakout groups um, in a moment is to try and come up with a powerful question as a group, one powerful question that if you were to explore in your teams and in your organizations could make a significant difference, could create new perspective and understanding. And it's not easy. So when we, when we go into the breakout groups, um, just first of all, take a few moments to share the kinds of questions that you're currently asking in your teams. And again, don't judge or analyze or do anything like that. Um, a lot of us are asking very solution oriented questions. And the reason I want you to do that is because when we come back from the breakout, I want to give you just a little bit of input about questions. Um, I think many of us don't understand how questions actually work and the different impact they have when, when we ask them and how they land or often how they don't land. So in the breakout uh, rooms, if we could just have the breakout slide and I'll just explain uh, what this is about. Um, take some time very quickly, each person share one or two questions that are really prevalent, present in your teams at the moment, and then spend the majority of the time as a group trying to come up with a question that could be relevant to the public sector, or it may be relevant to one particular part of the public sector. A powerful question um, with some of those characteristics we saw in the previous slide, and we could probably paste those into the chat room. Um, okay, bye Alison, <laughs> remember to breathe. Um, and when we come back, we'll look at questions and how difficult they may be for you. Okay, so um, thank you for putting those in and we'll just revisit them in a second. But I just wanted to go back to this slide that um, we were looking at before we went into the breakout groups. 
And that's a very uh, well-known quote, and many of you may, may know it, but it's something I work with um, and contemplate with uh, executives and leaders a lot, that often our solutions, because of the way in which they have been constructed, don't work. Um, and one of the reasons, perhaps, that they don't work is we haven't spent the time trying to actually understand the problem. And I don't want this to all be about COVID. It, this is about leadership and, and our lives in general. And I, I like that quote. And I, I, when I work with groups, particularly around complex problem solving, we do spend a lot of time trying to work out what exactly is the question or the problem we are trying to uh, address. And through a deep inquiry, it often turns out that the thing we thought we were trying to sort out isn't the thing we were trying to sort out, it's something further upstream. So, you know, a little tip that once we are out of crisis, um, although I would say even in crisis, some deep thinking is, is beneficial, um, taking time with our teams to develop the art of inquiry uh, is an extraordinary capacity and skill of leadership, I believe. And it's hard for the reasons that I'm going to, uh, to talk about in a second. So when, when I'm talking about what makes a question work, you might want to revisit what's up on the, um, on the chat and see where your questions might fit with, uh, with what I'm saying. So if we could move into the first slide, which is how do questions work? Um, so often our questions don't work or land well because we're not actually clear about our intent. So intent behind the question is everything. Let me give you some examples. We might find ourselves asking a directive question. You'll see that in the first um, uh, section on that slide. And the, the intent behind a directive question is to progress things. So it could be something like, have you finished that report yet? That's a directive question. However, our actual intention might have been that we wanted to actually discover whether that member of staff was coping with the workload. And that question, have you finished the report yet, is not going to land very well or find out for us uh, the quality of experience that we're looking for. So a better question might have been, how are you feeling about the report deadline right now? And that would take us more into a clarifying question, which is to understand the second question down. Or we might find ourselves asking a provoking question. Why did you make that stupid comment today? Provoking question. When actually our better intent, our good intent was again to try and clarify. So we could ask something like, well, what was the intent behind your comment today? And the subtleties that come, sometimes not so subtle actually, in the differences of our questions depending on the intent behind them is so important for us to begin to notice. What is the intent behind my question? Because if I'm not clear about the intent and I don't structure the question in relation to that intent, my question isn't going to land very well and is very likely to create confusion um, and be received uh, as if it's a criticism or an accusation or a demand. Okay, so our questions have different intents and up there we see directive, clarifying, provocative, and the one that I think is the deepest kind of question is the humble question. The question that we ask when we genuinely don't know the answer to something and we genuinely want to find out. And research around questions in organisations and, and generally suggests that 80 to 90% of the questions we ask in life are not questions at all. They're uh, statements or opinions in disguise. 
So my challenge to you is to pay attention to the quality of questions that you ask as you go about in your leadership and your management of teams um, and to see how many are allowing new knowledge to surface through a more humble form of inquiry and, and question creation. Uh, my suspicion is we don't do much humble inquiry in our organisations. I'm just looking here at questions. So um, let's go to the next slide, which is more technique based, but actually I do think it's um, quite useful. So the, the next, the, the other three things to pay attention to when you're trying to come up with a question is its construction, its scope, and the assumptions that uh, underpin it. So in terms of structure, just look at the graphic on the right-hand side, the powerful questions graphic. But basically, virtually any question can be converted into a more powerful question by moving it up that pyramid. Although be cautious because why questions uh, often don't work because the tone and the intent is not clear or muddled or um, confused. You need to be very genuinely curious to ask a why question. And if your why question, and I saw a few whys, you kind of know the answer, then it's not really a very powerful why question. Okay. The next one is scope. If you're asking questions that are outside the scope of people to make to take action, they usually feel to the person being asked it uh, much less effective or, or actually quite stressful. So uh, 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 an example might be, uh, how can we solve world poverty is less powerful then how can our organisation help to solve poverty in our community or our region? So scope, the question has to motivate people to want to engage with it. And if it's too big, people just kind of yeah, become helpless or disinterested or disengage. And the final one, of course, really important is be aware of the assumptions that are embedded within the questions that you ask. So how sad are you feeling right now? Assumes that a person is sad, right? I mean, these are obvious and easy examples. How can we fix this problem? Well, that's assuming that problems are there to be fixed and that's the way that you deal with a problem. What do you want to say right now? Well, that's assuming someone wants to say anything. So when we start to get into this territory of questions, it's an extraordinarily rich and... Um, skilled field and I think from a leadership perspective and as practice three in our perception practices uh, it can only start to happen when we have found a way of centering ourselves so our questions aren't defensive and accusatory um, and also when we are able to receive much more of our own experience and are grounded in in a more honest appreciation of where we're coming from. And then we become uh, more able to ask and create better questions. So it's hard and to do that in 10 minutes would, was probably virtually impossible. So well done for even beginning that. And I'm glad you had some good conversations um, as, a, as, a, as a result anyway. If anyone wants to ask a burning question now would seem the right place to do that. So I'm just going to pause before we recap what we've done so far. Does anyone want to clarify or ask anything about um, questions or even the previous two practices? I appreciate this is a lot for people to take in. Yes, I mean, Andy, what you've just put in the box there is absolutely right. You know, what is the point in asking a question if somewhere you already know the answer? But those so many of our questions are like that, actually. One of the um, things that my clients moan about a lot is that they're offered uh, uh, their consultation in organisations is so fake. 
that the, you're, you're offered a uh, opportunity to consult on a policy or process, but uh, the decision has already been made. And so inviting people into an inquiry around something is... is Absolutely it, right. Yeah. yeah, it's like, and people know it. People sense it and it's a waste of time. If you as a leader have already made a decision, just have the courage to say you've made a decision. You're interested in feedback and it might impact that decision, but there's the decision. Um, yeah, would that happen more? So, yeah, so... Let's recap. Conscious leadership and collaborative relationships require us to be centered, open, aware, and genuinely curious. We'll come on to that side in a second. Um, because in these practices, what we're learning to do is we're learning to notice and if necessary, soothe threat emotions that throw us off center and make our responses very reactive. We're learning to stay open and receptive to experience, to live a more honest life of what is and not what should be or what we hope is. And we're learning to become more curious and interested in ourselves and each other. And in particular, we're developing the art of humble inquiry, where we genuinely want to know, we genuinely want to share the fact that we don't know, um, and in doing so, invite uh, more meaning and understanding before solution and action. Okay. Yes, we definitely need more time and space to ask questions. And I think that's one of the things that I'm slightly nervous about in the moment when I'm teaching this particular class, because I, I, I really understand people are under massive pressure. But we will get through this and we will get to a time where a lot of this work can come back into our into our day to day uh, beings with each other. So, OK, so into we're going to go into the final practice, practice four. Um, so let me remind as well that conscious leadership, the, the, the title gives it away involves the growth of our consciousness and as we continually are learning and adapting and responding to life challenge. And we're trying to do this as we grow consciousness with greater maturity and depth. So the final practice for helps us grow consciousness by making us more aware of that which was unconscious. And to do this, we need to draw on what I call our imaginal capability. And that's when we move on to the next slide. So I'll just give you a moment to have a look at the rational capability on the right side, which is um, the dominating capability in our education systems, in our work environments and in our cultures. And the imaginal capability uh, has been relegated, I believe, in many, many contexts. And I think this is deeply wrong. So our, our rational capability through the faculty of our intellect helps us work with the contents of what's already in our conscious mind. However, it's the imaginal capability through the faculty of our imagination, which brings forth material and intelligence from our unconscious mind and in doing so helps us expand consciousness. And that's our aim if we're trying to develop mature, effective responses to the world. So just have a little moment to take in some of those differences. And then what I would say, <laughs> people often say, well, hang on a second, if something is unconscious, how can we pay attention to it? Good question. But the unconscious is not as unconscious as we may think or hope. And in fact, this phenomenon that we call the unconscious is really present in our lives. And we know it in, in our day and our night dreams. We know it in the strange emotions and feelings we have and often don't understand. We know it in our emotional outbursts in our gut instincts, we know it in our supposedly out of character choices and actions and so on. 
And when we ignore or deny our unconscious processes, they become more likely to interfere in our lives and cause us problems. Or worse, they never have a chance to contribute their intelligence into our sense making and our choices. So there are quite a few ways of working with the unconscious. And what I've what I advise is, is that if you are really fascinated in unconscious processes and over lockdown over the last year, a lot of people have been talking to me about vivid dreams that they never used to have. Um, and really wanting to, to understand those. And I, I do think that if you are wanting to become an inner voyager, it's worth getting some help because often the deeper we go, the more um, difficult it can be to sense make or even integrate what we're learning. And it can be frightening for some people as well. But there are simple exercises we can do as beginners exploring our unconscious tendencies. And the one that I want you to do in the... Uh, next breakout is called a reversal exercise a very simple exercise and we'll just have a look at it in the moment and what the reversal exercise does um, it, it reminds us that in everything in every experience we have the opposite experience also exists and it exists within us and denying or ignoring our opposites doesn't make them go away so I might be a very, very active person in my life, but I also have in me the capability for deep laziness, right? There's a simple opposite. Um, people who work with the unconscious, the analysts of our time uh, say that the work of maturation is that we name these opposites, we discover them and we learn to integrate them. We don't disappear them. So, in workshop two, I'm really aware at the moment that the public sector, rightly so on many levels, um, is, is seen as heroic and many heroic terms are being given to it, many great, brilliant characteristics, and that is right. And so the first part of the exercise is to just list as a group, what are the six brilliant qualities of the public sector that are being talked about at the moment, what's good. And then what I'd like you to do is find the opposite of each quality. So I've got an example there, diligent uh, could be the quality and the opposite might be lazy. And what we're doing here is revealing the polarities of our experience, okay? And as I said, they coexist. Um, and sometimes we end up only focusing on one end of the polarity. And then in the discussion that follows, I'd like you to talk about how you, in your teams or in your organisations, enable people to openly discuss and, and attempt to work through their potential shadow qualities. Okay. See how that goes. Um, it's it's a, it's an intro into looking at the shadow side of leadership. See how that feels for you. See, see where it happens. And I, I hope everyone gets to get into a into a breakout group. Um, and again, once more, I'm going to hand over to Effie and ask you to come back uh, at twenty past again. So more opportunity for networking and conversation for you. Okay, folks, um, I hope that was uh, an illuminating discussion and a little trip into perhaps the, some of the aspects of the unconscious, the shadow that we don't um, spend enough time on. And I, I was looking as you were in your breakout groups, a, a lovely uh, comment made by Dillis in the chat. She's written, nothing escapes, I'm assuming that's a she, Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, nothing escapes the subconscious mind. It quietly absorbs everything around you. And I just wanted now in the last part of this uh, uh, work or masterclass to invite people and to hear your voices. So I just wondered whether you wanted to say anything about that, Dillis, and what, and what that means for you. If you're out there, you may be in the number that hasn't returned. 
room and release your role. I mean, yeah. you, you can tell that your subconscious mind is paying more attention than you think because, you know, if somebody unexpectedly speaks to you, you know, you, you may instinctively respond by saying, you know, sorry, what? because you know something important's happened that's that's all it's 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 there it's it's a presence it takes it all in it really does and um there is quite a body of growing and significant research that which is showing that uh, our unconscious you call it the subconscious same um it's actually aware and this links into our whole thing about memory of absolutely everything that has occurred in our lives um, even things that at the time we weren't consciously paying attention to. And I think that's just a phenomenal thought that down somewhere this treasure trove um, of knowing, of memory, of intelligence is, is within us. And I, I just wanted to remind people who, who watched uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's Sherlock Holmes and his mind palace, um, and in a way that, you know, that's what he was doing. He, he had a skill and ability to go and remember things from deep down, far away and things he didn't even know he knew. So um, the more I work with and talk to people, the more I realize that their rational, their conscious knowing is incredibly limited. And so conscious leadership, just to reiterate, you know, is about drawing material from, from the knowing that resides beyond the left brain intellect. And again, neuroscientists will tell us that the left brain can only work with material it already has. And it needs um, the intuitive right brain to feed it with rich new material. Um, but turning on our imaginal capability, our imaginal muscles uh, is difficult, like turning on any muscle that we don't use um, unless we use it and cultivate it. And as I said in the article, that unfortunately in our education systems, we very quickly uh, privilege the rational capability over the imaginal. And with it, I think a lot of knowing from our unconscious uh, selfhood yeah so I just look we're coming to the end of the session and I'd really love to hear any questions or observations from anything we've done this morning um, together if you feel able to to contribute I know it's a large group but it feels small it feels like a little community some of you know each other does anyone have anything they might want to to share with the group, even if it was from that last quite, um, well, I think it's quite provoking conversation to look at reversals and look at shadows. Did anyone feel uncomfortable doing that uh, shadow exercise? Did it come easily? I have, I have no sense of what you were coming up with in those groups. So there's someone who feels confident in sharing to say, did, did, was it easy to discover the opposites and did they feel like qualities or characteristics mm -hmm. that do exist in our services at the moment? I mean, I would say in our group, we had some quite strong conversations around some of the militaristic language and some of the language being used around healthcare workers about heroes and saviors and yes, yes. service and, and, and the flip side of that is the fact they are employees and there's no space to talk about their needs and you know how, you know no 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 voice for them prior to this pandemic and there won't be probably a voice post it. You know, where they talked about, you know, their issues, shortage of staff, shortage of funding, etc. So we talked, you know, about that. And however, we sort of discussed different themes. Those were the things that came up. Yes. I mean, you, you point to a really important thing that is happening in this heroic saviour type language. 
which I think is quite challenging for some people who are really struggling to live up to those things. Um, so yeah, I, I hope you do find opportunities, Pam. Um, what, why, what, what makes you think you won't? Not for me personally, but just thinking about just how the government has treated the NHS historically. Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, uh, Nalisha, in, in our group, we, had, we found the, the session fascinating and it really did get into some uh, great opposites and so on. But we were having a conversation about um, the sort of, psychological con contract that we have with our service users citizens and patients and that the nhs um, is needing to adopt and evolve a very different sort of leadership where actually we cede powers um consciously to those who use our services and give them um, an honest and fair opportunity to take the, the, the power to plan what services they want locally um, and there's some tensions there because also we talked about this bit about honesty versus dishonesty and the level of resource we've got and the level of transparency about how resource is allocated, how much there is, who might not get the services that they really need and yet we're kind of asking citizens and patients to design services and inviting them in but there's going to be some hard choices around rationing and how you deploy the resource you've got so we had a fascinating discussion around all, all of that um one of one of the um typical shadows in in leadership is is points to what you're talking about which is we want to empower others and we don't because we're leaders and we know it all. And that, that polarity is one worth facing into, right? Yeah. Um, you know, the language of empowerment is what we're supposed to be talking, but let us not pretend that somewhere underneath and within that is also a language of, I don't want to do that. I want to control, I want to do it myself. Um, yeah. So yeah, having those conversations in a compassionate way is is good. Um, but yeah, yeah. One of the things when we explore the con the unconscious processes is that we it's not really answers that we get. It's just understanding and acceptance, and that's a very different outcome to how we're usually trained to be, right? We have a problem, we need an answer. Well, do we, or do we just need to understand and accept what is? Yeah. I mean, the, the, um, we, we cannot surface these deeper forms of experience and knowing through the rational. We have to bring those capabilities you see on the left-hand side into into our work now the public sector is traditionally understood as being able to do that better than for example the corporate sector but is it i mean i, I worked in the nhs for 10 years i mean we tried i don't know how how far we got so yeah a lot of my work now is going to be going into the space of trying to help organizations really face into those different ways of knowing and to come at problems and relationships and, and so on through through both through both ways. Anyone else want to Effie, Effie has noted that we've got colleagues with hands up. I don't oh, know. Effie, yes, please, I can't see any of that. So um, please, yes. I've raised my hand. Yeah. Hi. Right. Uh, hi, I'm Fauzi. Um, sorry, I couldn't join the, um, you know, the last group. For some reason, the system won't let me. I think my computer is probably outdated or something. But um, one thing I, I, you know, I was reflecting on, um, we pride ourselves with 
being democratic and working with people and uh, you know all of this. But since the, the start of the pandemic, we've gone into a tactical and command kind of system. And uh, the people who used to pride with, you know, to kind of feel that they, they, they were kind of very democratic and uh, used to be thoughtful and um, wanted to make sure that everything is done correctly, uh, actually liked the new way of working to a certain degree. So that's for me, you know, that kind of shadow quality which people have, mm. whereby, uh, you know, they said, well, brilliant. Now we could achieve A, B, C, D, E. So, 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 so essentially, you know, a great example is the uh, video consultations and video, you know, like, you know, the, a year ago, if, if I said to you, we'll have a board meeting via video, mm -hmm. uh, I would have been slaughtered. There'd be people like, there's no way I would accept it. Whereas now I think, you know, people said, oh, well, it's, that's, that's lovely. You know, we can get more people and, and so on and so on. So I think it's interesting in terms of seeing the opposite side of you, uh, you know, pretty much in a very short space of time. Now, I don't, you know, I don't suppose that these people will want to carry on doing the same thing forever. But I think a lot of people actually liked, you know, to, to use their opposite side for a, for a while. Yes, and that's a lovely point because the rhythm of movement between our different qualities is where we want to get to. We don't want to label one as bad and one as good and so on. We want to see them as, as, as integral parts of our capability. And there are times when we do want to be told what to do. Um, mm -hmm. And then there are times we don't. It doesn't mean we're being inconsistent. It means context. Someone mentioned context in the um, chat. It's really important. Um, so yeah, lovely point. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else who's got a hand up? I can't see, so someone will have to um, bring He in. has his hand up. I, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Just very briefly, uh, some, one thing we touched on in our group was um, uh, obviously in as much as we deal with the public, the public uh, want assurance. They don't really want to be told, well, we don't know what we're doing. Um, however, within the team, we felt that that kind of concealment can um, be damaging where people are afraid, even within the team to say, well, actually, I don't understand this. No, I can't do this without you telling me how to do it. It, I haven't really grasped this. You can get a situation where even within the team, people won't admit things to one another. Uh, mm. And uh, that is dangerous. There's got to be honesty uh, at that point. Mm. Andy, I, I think that some of what you're saying comes from the way that a lot of our information is fed through the media, which is very polarised, very accusatory and very yes. demanding of facts and certainties and it, I despair when I listen to it because I speak to just as many people who say look just tell me the truth if you don't know I'd rather hear that than some you know spin doctored version of something so I one of the things um, the imaginal capability suffers from is the media and I often um, say to people in a practical way, try turning it off for a couple of months. Um, <laughs> you won't be any the less wiser. In fact, you probably will be more wise. So again, another challenge for me is this, stop listening to the news every day if you're doing that. Um, you know, try something else. Uh, it's very dispiriting listening to the arguments and accusations that go on when that's least what we need at a time like this. Um, so I hope you can bring that sort of compassionate soothing into the teams you work with um, and at least give teams an opportunity to say, I don't know, with some free, with freedom. Yeah, because we don't know. And that's that's. We don't. There's far more we don't know than we do. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment? Yeah. I think I've raised my hand again. Sorry, it's Fauzi. Um, I, I suppose probably this is a question rather than uh, you know a comment, uh, and that's in relation to the um, um, vaccination and. Uh, how some people are reacting 
Um, because and I'm just wondering whether we sometimes what we're seeing is collective intellectualization, if you like, in terms of everybody knows, everybody now wants to know every single little detail about, you know, the, the you know how the, the kind of vaccine is is being made, uh, from what what is the percentage of this versus this, and how it works in this group versus this group, and and so on and so on. And you know, I don't recollect ever actually going through anything where we needed to explain so much. And whether and, and when you, you have a discussion with somebody, uh, no matter what answer you give them, they come up with something else and something else and something else. Um, uh, I mean, nobody knows exactly how the, the plane flies and, and uh, you know, how it's contract constructed and, uh, you know, at what speed it goes and what risk, you know, for one versus the other. I'm just wondering whether this is more like a defense mechanism, which people kind of, uh, yeah. Yes, it's absolutely. And, um... You know, one of the things that has fallen by the wayside is that as the rational culture has taken its grip over the last few hundred years is um, the, the, the disappearance of common sense, which is the uh, imaginal capability. And, uh, you know, that ability to ground oneself in good enough, right? It's good enough. Um, but yes, intellectualization is absolutely that. Uh, Thank you. You know, I had the privilege of working with uh, AstraZeneca over the summer, their, their people, and with them, and I, I work in Oxford. And I, I was delighted by the quality of the conversations that people were having, the, the lack of arrogance, the, the genuine curiosity, and it gave me great. Um, confidence that it's not going to be perfect but i was very confident in that process so if that's worth sharing um you know i'll share it but but what made those conversations um important was they weren't just in that rational space they were much much more um rich and open than that so yeah thank you thank you Okay, that's got, yes, go for it, yeah. I've got Elizabeth Harrison would like to say something. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Anisha, for this morning. It's been fascinating. Recently, I have been looking at my own shadow self, so it's been quite interesting this morning. Um, and it's been illuminating looking at my own shadow self as well, but I'm not going to go into that <laughs> right now. Another time. <laughs> um, but really, just following on from Fauzi, I think what we're dealing with is, people who can't face fear yes. and can't face their anxiousness yes. because as you say it's the fear and anxiousness and everybody feels not everybody but the media certainly feels that they have to provide answers and make things certain but what we're not accepting as a society and as individuals is we do not live in a certain world and right now it's even more uncertain than normal normally we can put this veneer of certainty over it right now we can't and that's what's scaring people more than anything because the veneer is kind of shattered the the thing we've built to manage our fear has been removed um and now people want to as far as he said they want to know everything about everything about everything with the ridiculousness that they have no idea what the answers mean mm. just as they get a long answer on facebook that's fine it must be true and that's why fake news is so prevalent but i'm really really heartened to what you said about astrazeneca because for me, it's much more than the rational side. The imaginal capability is huge and I don't think we use it enough. Mm -hmm. And I think it's often belittled when it is used. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the more we look at it in a, if we look at the imaginal in a rational sense, we can build it in and become more whole in the way that we think. So that's just what I've taken from this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just to say that, uh, the media do get more uh, hits and more exposure through fear stories than they do through good news stories. So from a business perspective, that's what they're interested in. Just bear that in mind. And I know it's an obvious point, but um, yeah, you know, I'm glad you're looking into your unconscious and I hope that you will relate to it as a fascinating and um, wonderful contribution to what you, you could know. Um, I mean, I, I, there are long things here about vaccines which look quite important. Um, 
All, all I would say is we don't know. And at the end of the day, these practices are about creating human beings who can make decisions for themselves in a centered way. Um, who aren't trying to persuade everyone else to do the same thing they're doing, but who have center, who are able to be receptive to the whole spectrum of emotion that arise in them, who are able to ask good questions of themselves and others, and who ultimately draw on a much greater pool of wisdom. And if you're doing those things, I think whatever decision you make is going to be the best one you possibly can, right? doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong in the end it's the best one you could have made in that moment so uh with that i just wanted to move to the final slide and just really sort of sum up and close the session and hand over to um to leslie again yeah i don't i was saying at the start of this call i, I don't really do eight or nine ways to do things if we go back to, to that slide but i thought if there are so many ways we could become more conscious that I did pick my favorite eight that I work with a lot with clients. And I will send you this, or I'm sure um, the collaborative can put this up somewhere where you can access it. But these are things that I work with in teams, I work with with individuals, and each one sit, has a practice or practices that sit underneath it. But the point I really want to make is that be, becoming more conscious is perfectly possible. And we need this in our world right now. So practice how to recenter when threat motions derail you. Be present to what is happening in the moment and don't let ancient memories keep sabotaging you. Learn to soften that inner critic and start holding truth lightly, which means you can start to embrace multiple perspective. And above all, try and cultivate and sustain curiosity in life and, and, and resist the urge to keep controlling. Um, and, and part of this involves reconnecting with your own and, and then other people's values. But all of it, and this is my final word really on the subject, and we've, we've finished a little ahead, but I think we've covered what we need to, is that all of this starts with learning to center ourselves when we're in threat. If we cannot do that, the rest does not follow uh, very well. So thank you everyone for listening to me. Um, Unless there is any final thing, I'm going to hand over to Leslie if that's okay. Alicia, thank you so much indeed. Um, do please continue, colleagues, to drop notes in the chat thank box. Thank you. Can I can I just extend an enormous thank you uh, to Alicia on behalf of all of us here today on the call and many more who will I know take the opportunity to listen to the recording. On behalf of the Northwest Collaborative, it's been an absolutely fascinating and engaging morning. The time has flown by, Alicia. It really has, and um, I, I've I've learned such a great deal from um, hearing from other colleagues, from yourself. Uh, I I really think the art of practicing becoming more conscious is something we'll we'll all go away and pay more attention to. I personally going to be tuning into that self-compassion breaks. Mm. Um, that's really resonated with me, tackling that inner critic, because uh, sometimes it can be awfully loud in my ear. Um, and mm. I hope all of us will take away something to practice going forward. Uh, as, as you've said all along, Alicia, this has been a dip in, a toe in the water. Um, and, and it's so generous of you to offer to connect after today with colleagues who may want to um, be connected with your new book or follow up on particular aspects that um, you've whet the appetite, I know from the responses in the chat box um, so far. So really great to have you with us in the Northwest. We really hope you're gonna keep coming and seeing us and uh, checking in on, on the work we're doing. And we're certainly gonna be fascinated to keep close with the work you're doing. Um, so many important um, learnings that we, we can share and collaborate around. Um, 
colleagues, before I, I let you go to face the rest of your afternoon, uh, I did just want to draw attention to the Masterclass series as, as it's rolling forward. Uh, you felt from today and those who attended in November when uh, Maria was with us uh, for the first time, you, you'll know now the style and the approach for these masterclasses. And I'm delighted that the Northwest Collaborative will be bringing another session on the 5th of March is, um, to explore the impact of the pandemic on our mental health. And we'll be, met, we'll be welcoming Jake Mills uh, from Chasing the Stigma, a mental health charity on that occasion. And then on the 26th of March, um, we will be uh, doing a session on building a health and well-being culture uh, in your workplace. And that's with Sue Fowler-Johnson and team. And you'll see that all of these sessions, they, they very helpfully speak um, in concert with each other. There's a lot of triangulation around these themes, which, uh, which really adds to, 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 the, um, to the benefit. Uh, we'll be putting the information on how to join those. In fact, I can see it's gone in now in the chat box. There's uh, opportunities for you to register and um, please do indeed share that with other colleagues who haven't been able to be here today. Uh, we, we, we really want to uh, ensure that everyone has sight of those workshops, uh, masterclasses as they come along. Someone's already commented what a super speaker Jake is and uh, I for one really looking forward to that session. Um, I'm going to look to uh, my support crew if I may if there are any other points that I've, I've forgotten to make and can I just extend a really big thank you um, to our colleagues Pam, Julie, Al Alana, Effie, um, Sue, you, you've really really helped us um, run this session as smoothly as we can. I know there's a few technical challenges with breakout rooms, but when you're managing, you know, 90 odd people, Effie, well done. Uh, I, th I think it's a job well done all round. So I wish everybody the best of afternoons. I hope you have a restful weekend. Those of you who are not working, of course, keep safe. Um, let's all appreciate uh, those that we work with and those that we care for and let's practice that compassionate kindness in each and every um, transaction that we have. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye for now.